Hello. Hello. Can you all hear me okay? I hope. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Nice to. Doing some last second clicking. <laughs> So are you presenting, Stephen, or is Laura? Uh, I'm going to present for the first couple minutes, and then my colleague Ian O'Dwyer is going to be um, presenting a bulk of the information today. Awesome. OK, cool. Um, and just so you know, it's going to be recorded. Is that OK? Yep, absolutely. Awesome. All right. Um, yeah, and we usually give people about five minutes to join. Cool. How's everything going? Pretty good. I got my you're coffee, at, so I'm happy. <laughs> you're in the phone booth today? Yep. <laughs> um, little pods. Is Netflix like cutthroat with meeting rooms? No, but there are a lot more people coming in. We've got some new graduates who yeah. joined, so the rooms are booked up a lot more. And sometimes it's just easier to grab these <laughs> little pods. When I was in at Amazon, like I remember I'd sat, I found a room, it wasn't reserved, sat down, started my meeting, and then someone knocked on the door and said, I just reserved this room. It's time for you to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, yeah. <laughs> it's rough. My fight. Well, and then there are the folks who will book something for a whole year or two, <laughs> and maybe even two or three times. Right, yeah. yeah. Or like they don't like their desks, so they'll reserve like the biggest conference room just to work in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh. How large? Excuse me. How large is the working group, Chris? Is it you know two or three people, or is it thirty or forty people? No, uh, we have two chairs, and then we have. About when we have 93 people in the room, anyways, the channel um, that we announced to in the chat in. Um, and then the uh, handful of people routinely uh, join in and listen. So, and here's VJ, he's our co chair on the group. Hello. Thanks for joining. Hey, Hey everyone. Sorry, I'm a little late. Let me uh, make sure Laura has the invite so that she can join. You're on mute there, Steven. We're just still waiting for people to trickle in, Neil. Okay. Yeah, give another minute or two if nobody else joins and um, we'll have it recorded at least. And Okay. That'll be good. Hey, VJ, can you at channel on the query language channel in Slack? I don't have permission to load Slack. What's the um? What's kind of like been the life cycle of the the working groups that you've participated in, Chris? Is it are these you know nine month sprints or you know three year commitments? I guess they depend on how the project and the investigation and the work goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just depends. Like this one's going to be kind of a slow slog. I think we plan it out for about three quarters, but it's going to probably be at least a year and a half. I think. Okay, and the and the way I've been explaining this or comprehending it 
mentally is really trying to figure out what the standards should be for query languages in the observability space. Yep. Exactly. Cool. Right. Thanks, Vijay. Okay. Well, it's five after, so if anybody trickles in after, oh, it's like Laura's hopping on. Then, yeah, I suppose we can get started. We'll just have this recorded and then we'll um, upload it for the All other right. folks in the group to view at their convenience. So, the, the, the burden of, uh, of interaction and questioning is now on you and BJ. So, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the burden uh -huh. of spacing questions is on the KX team. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, I'll try. We'll try to hold up our end here. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. Um, so just some quick updates to record for folks who want to know. Um, we have a couple of PRs in um, uh, from designer interview question responses from the Google Monarch team. Um, that PR, I think I merged it already, actually. Uh, or uh, We also have one from Sergey and the Microsoft um, internal KQL monitoring team. And we also got one from Julius on PromQL. So those emerged. Then thank you to the folks at KX, uh, KX here for uh, filling out the DSL interview questions there. I'm going to go through them hopefully this week, and I'll try creating a PR and then submit that to you all for final review, and then we can merge that, um, get that in. Upcoming, I still have uh, Datadog is working on theirs. Um, the AWS folks are working on theirs as well. I'm also reaching out to um, some folks at Tencent, Alibaba, et cetera, through the Skywalking um, observability group um, because they have a lot of good contacts there. So still going through that. Um, and then there was a good post, a couple of interesting posts um, from Austin Parker that VJ uh, mentioned. I'm going to link those in the channel too in Slack, um, just arguing for LLM support. So. We'll have to see how that goes. Right. So I want to thank everybody, Stephen, Ian, Laura, Neil from KX Systems um, for joining us to talk about the Q uh, query language for KDB. Um, it's been around for a long, long time. And I know before I joined working on OpenTSB, um, this was kind of one of the projects I looked to to see how it works and see how you work with time series data. So it'd be nice to see, you know, from these folks uh, what they've encountered over the years, why the language is designed like it is and kind of how it works. So I'll turn it over Perfect. to Stephen. Chris, thanks so much. Um, Steve Elliott, we have a few KXers on the phone, uh, including my uh, myself, uh, Ian, Neil, and Laura. Um, so I think to kick off, Chris, we, I do just want to say um, we've had a chance to speak to a number of different teams at varying levels of our org chart about this presentation. Um, there is a, a wholehearted sentiment to support the working group. Uh, we were really excited that you reached out to us. And one, you knew about KDB and you knew about Q. That's always pretty cool when we, we find people outside of financial services that have an understanding of it. Um, but you, the working group has the full support of KX. So we would love to be involved, um, submit more responses to the survey and uh, anything we can do to contribute and positively impact the working group, we would love to do. So thank you very much for including us. Um, what we wanted to do with our time today is you know, kind of introduce KDB and Q uh, to the working group. I actually labeled this as con, uh, considerations, you know, kind of give you a hist historical view of the technology, the things that have impacted it in the past and kind of where it stands now. Um, a bulk of our time will be spent with Ian, who is gonna who put together a nice demo in pretty short order here that I think takes the use cases that you had provided us, Chris, 
uh, which we kind of broke down as like high high volume problems. Like how do you deal with high volumes of data, and then high velocity problems. So how do you do with how do you deal with high velocity, and then talk a little bit about how Q and KDB kind of handles those simultaneously at scale. Um, but ultimately, we want to have a conversation with the working group. Uh, we want to learn about the observability space a little bit more. Uh, I don't want to take the wind out of anybody's sails right now, but like we've historically played in financial services. And I think observability in the traditional sense is an area that KX has not played in and KDB and Q has not been applied. So we're really interested actually to learn more about it. Um, and yeah, generally that's it. So those are our goals today. And again, I, I appreciate you having us. Um, can everybody see my screen, by the way? Yep. Okay, perfect. So the introduction to KDB and Q, um, I think much like any technology company, you know, you ship your culture, uh, let alone your, your product. And the, I think the power, uh, the impact that Q has uh, on our customers is very much derived from our history and our culture. This is just a set of pictures, I think, just to kind of set a tone of the company that KX is. Um, and I'll dive a little bit into the background there, but, you know, headquartered in Ireland, uh, the technology has been around for almost 30 years. Arthur Whitney in the pink shirt, there's the one who originally wrote it. Um, and then this is just a group of, of pictures of different folks across the company uh, who work on the technology. And so I, my background is in cloud. I spent a majority of my career at AWS and a little bit at Google. And when I came here, it's just, KX is just kind of this like, funky little small but mighty company that's been working on this really really powerful technology called q and kdb and so i just kind of wanted to set that tone of like you know this is this is who you're working with um and we just it's a pretty interest it's a really interesting technology it's a really interesting company it's a it's a company filled with actually just great people who want to do really really good work so i think that's important to call out um Historically, though, Q, uh, as you mentioned, Chris, it's been around for uh, over 30 years almost, and it's based on APL, which was first written um, by, uh, by Irison at Harvard, and then it was introduced to IBM in the 60s as a vector programming language. So APL is a vector programming language, and the core function of Q is that it's able to process lists of numbers in a single operation. There's been a ton of investment over the years um, uh, alongside a lot of tier one banks. Uh, the technology has been developed. And now where we are is we're bringing Q and KDB um, into the modern programming languages uh, with Python. So this past year, we open sourced part of our Python library, which is called PyKX. And that is now a way for Python skill sets to be able to interact and work and get started with Q. Um, the other important consideration that is the design objectives of Q. Um, even though you can work with it in, in Python, uh, you will eventually uh, want to interact or have to interact with Q. And the design objectives there that we see are they're based on, the language is based on expressiveness, speed, and efficiency. So as Ian kind of peels back the onion on, on how you work with Q and with KDB, I think you'll see those different design objectives come through in a few different ways. Um, but you know, blocking and tackling, as I mentioned, um, KX is headquartered uh, in Ireland. Um, we are founded in Nuri. Uh, we've been around for 30 years. We are used by uh, 39 of the top 40 banks. Um, I have a colleague who says it a little bit more bluntly. He says, if we turned off our licensing manager, Wall Street would crash. So we have a number of large tier one banks that run all their risk assessment, their high frequency trading, uh, their predictive analysis, all on KDB and KX technology. Uh, this has evolved to some an expanding ecosystem outside of uh, Wall Street and capital markets, uh, most notably with AWS and Snowflake, where they had uh, we had mutual customers who wanted to be doing their time series analysis with KDB and Q in the cloud. And so now we've developed some really strong partnerships there and are starting to expand uh, into new industries outside of financial services with a lot of traction in aerospace, defense, 
manufacturing and automotive. Um, so that's a very high level of, of where we are at from a company standpoint. Um, to take it one layer deeper on the left-hand side here with real-time analytics, this is our bread and butter primary use case of where most of our customers apply KDB and Q. Uh, whether it's you know anomaly detection for manufacturing plant floors or anomaly detection in capital markets, uh, being able to uh, ingest data at a high volume and to unify that with your historical data in real time is essentially KDB and Qs and to be able to query it um, in real time measured in milliseconds. That is our kind of core capability to be able to unify your streaming data and your historical data and to be able to query it in a time measured in, in milliseconds. That's really where we play. As I mentioned earlier, it's built on APL, which is a vector programming language. So we have native vector capabilities. Um, we're in private preview right now with our vector database, which is called KDB AI. And then you can also use KDB, whose binary is actually very, very small. Um, so it's a very attractive solution to embed into other pieces of software. So that is the, the context and the landscape that I want to lay uh, for Ian. Um, he's put together a, uh, a little bit of a demo and, a, and um, that he can walk you through um, based on the use cases, Chris, that you have provided us. So any questions before we get into that? Cool. All right, Ian, I will hand it over to you. Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. That's let me let me know, um, Steve, if that's coming through. Not yet. I think I need to stop sharing. This is loading. Let me take a minute. There you go. Now there I can go. see it. Okay, great. <laughs> Things are running a bit slow today. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for having us on. Um, yeah, I guess I just I, I wanted to focus on um I guess the the Q programming language today and kind of I'll you know touch on how that uh, relates to to KDB. I guess maybe just a bit of background for me. Um, I'm a sales engineer, so I work in the sales org. I assist um folks there to um I guess te technically with with clients and and getting them um up and running with with this powerful technology. Um. My background, I've been with KX six years now, and I was a developer for about four or five of those. So um, me, along with a couple of others along here with KX, are kind of very passionate about um, Q and KDB. And I could certainly talk uh, for a long time about this and the uniqueness and the, how powerful it is. Um, so I guess, you know, Steve told you today about Arthur Whitney, who basically created this technology. Um, I want to kind of show you some some of the query language today, and it's we, we call it QSQL, um, I guess, which is just the the I guess the the select and and update and 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 uh, delete uh, functionality of of the programming language. You can kind of see how he would have taken inspiration from ANSI SQL, perhaps. Um, so. I'll start here. I've just created a little function here with with um, variables. Um, you know, you can quickly see select from met metrics for time within. You know, the equivalent in SQL is you know select star from metrics where time between and two timestamps. Um, so you can see the similarities there. Um, people often don't have too much of a headache picking this this um, programming language up. Uh, another, I guess famous quote of, of mine that I like to use is a guy called Nick Saris. He's uh, works in, in Bank of America. He's he's one that's been super passionate about learning new programming languages and, and technologies over the years. And I think he famously said recently how when he came across Q, he knew he didn't want to learn any other language. That was kind of the end of it for him. He was so impressed by the conciseness and just the power of this technology. Um, hey, Ian, there's a request to slightly zoom in on your screen. Sure. Yeah. Um, let me see.
Is that looking a bit better? That was my own. Warrior two. I know that my could not be a bit sensitive. Um, so yeah, you can see how Arthur took uh, inspiration from Nancy Sequel. You can see how he looked at some characters and ways of querying and thought that was too much or that's using too many characters or that's a waste and he got rid of it. So star is a very easy one. Why are we doing select star when I can just do select from uh, or the and operator? I'm just going to, you know, remove two characters and use a comma instead. Um, so things like that, I, I quite like. Uh, they're quite interesting. So, yeah, look, I guess I just want to I, I took your example, Chris, um, that was forwarded on to me, kind of Kubernetes monitoring metrics, um, you know, CPU used. Uh, I tried to create some dummy data here that I'm pumping through in, in real time. And, you know, I think that, as Steve said, that the challenge could be is, well, the reality is, you know, you can you have a Kubernetes cluster that, uh, you know, is spread across many regions and different applications and different namespaces. And you want to analyze all that data. Well, quickly, you know, at, at its core, yeah, there's there's te you know plenty of vendors out there that you know does does this kind of monitoring and observability. But I quickly saw how well when you get into the thousands of you know pods generating lots of metrics it very quickly becomes a big data problem. Um, and to be able to analyze that data is no easy feat. And I guess that's where, where we come in and that's our USP. Um, you know, as, as um, Steve said, you know, we've, our heritage is in the financial market space, but at the end of the day, this is all time series data, right? It's got a time, it's got, you know, a, an attribute of our car column, a, a field, and it's got a value, right? <laughs> Very basic. It's it's our bread and butter. You know, it it's nothing different than as again, Steve said, we've moved into the world of automotive, right? Think of sensor data coming off a car. It's got a timestamp. It's got a value, right? What's the oil temperature or the wheel RPM? And it's got a, its corresponding value. It's all the same. I I I look at these things very simply, and data is data, or time series data. Um, Anyway, let me let me show you a quick example, right? So, and, and to go along with the syntax of, of Q, and I'll make you familiar along the way. And please stop me at any point to ask any questions. Um, I've, I've I've used our product. Uh, it's it's an enterprise product. The um, users are, are picking up a lot these days because it just makes building applications easier. Um, but uh, and as as Steve said, we can interface with this technology through SQL and Python, but at the end of the day, everything's getting translated to Q in some shape or form. Um, we can't forget that KDB and Q is there at the core and we'll, you know, that'll never change. And that's kind of it, our, our secret sauce, I guess, in a way. Um, so we've just do a simple, simple query. Um, I've created a metrics table. We're gonna filter that on time. We're filtering on metric, pod, app, region, namespace, and so on and so forth. So I've put together some variables and, here. And this is and this is based on the data schema that Chris had provided us around the types of data that might be flowing off of a very large Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I, I've taken. I think there's. I created two metrics. One that was suggested CPU percent busy. And I took a. I made a RAM one as well, right? Because that they're going to be two typical ones. Um. And then I've tried to, you know, mock up some variability um, within those uh, metrics. Uh, but again, fake data is always a struggle trying to to make these things. Um, so I've I've done my best. Um, the the visuals might be a little bit spiky, but um, hopefully you you get the idea. Um, so again, I've just created this lambda function. Um, dot z dot p is just a uh, like a time dot now we'll say equivalent in Python. Um, and I've also done a start time of two hours before now. I'm gonna filter on CPU. I've picked out a couple of pods and apps and region stuff. So I can execute that. I've told it, oh, my windows are gone a bit funky now since zooming in. I've told that to store in an output variable B. I'll show you that here. So I'll just execute that. Oh, I've done that all. Bear with me now. This is I probably haven't refreshed this page in a bit. Hold on. 
I'll give this a quick refresh, I think. Any questions there so far on the language? I'm sure, you know, is it looking alien? Is it looking familiar? Any comments so far? Yeah, I'm curious about all of those, uh, the back ticks there. Yes, okay. <laughs> Great question, yeah. Um, so I guess we have two ways that we express bar chars in, in KDB. One is a simple string, but also, uh, you know, I guess, I, 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 again, I don't have a background in computer science or anything. Um, I picked up this language sort of, uh, I did a business degree and I just joined KX and they taught me this language, right? Um, so yeah, we've got strings, but we've also got this uh, concept called, we call a symbol. And it's another way that, that kind of makes our technology performant. It's it's a way of um, kind of indexing. It's how we enumerate things. Um, so it's just a, another way of expressing bar cards. Uh, if it, it's it's a design um, feature as well. So if you know if we need to do quick an analytics on you know this particular column. And there's not a lot of, it's not a GUID, for example. It's not got infinite amount of, you know, variability or changes. We we would go with a symbol type. Um, and yeah, basically it just, it's kind of a performance feature. So yeah, um, did we get going there? We got B, yeah, we got the variable B populated. This is like just the raw data here. I'll scroll down. So you can see that's a pretty standard table um, with some, some metrics going. Now, the powerful part of this is A, yeah, retrieving the data it, we're fast at, but also doing the, the analysis very quickly. So um, I also threw in a pivot um, function. Um, and also we're going to query, again, some some another QSQL statement. And you can see the, the similarities with, with ANSI SQL here. So I'm getting the min, max, average. I'm going to group that by the environment, which options are, you know, production, dev, UAT. I'm also grouping by pod. And I'm going to bucket on at a minute sort of granularity from that um, variable. So that gives us the following output again. Sorry. Um, and from there, we want to maybe pivot that and, you know, prepare it for visualization. So again, sorry, I'm going around here with the, the screen. Uh, I'll run this command. Something like that. And he wants me to run this, I think. Get the function in there, run that function. Okay, and we've very easily and quickly bucketed that variable C using that function. Um, so we're keying it by bucket and, and we're kind of pivoting it on pod and we're picking out the, the average values at this point. Um, so you can, you know, I think I can probably jump into visual at this point, actually. And Ian, is there, is this the appropriate time when it, the data that you're executing on there, how many rows is that? What's kind of the ingest there that you've set yeah. up? Let me do a count B on that and I'll jump back to console. So I think there was, yeah, there was 800,000 rows there that we filtered down from the query up here. For the record, so that, that was a loaded question I just asked Ian. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, I can show you, actually, let me run this query up here and we can get a sense of, well, how much data are we filtering on, I guess? Um, let me run this. I think it was something like four, oh, nearly three, three point nine, three and a half, four, four million rows per hour is what we're looking at here. So. Nothing, nothing um, small, um, but also not um, large for KDB. Um, we're running on pretty uh, relatively small hardware here. Like this, this environment here is running on a Kubernetes cluster of a, I don't know, sixty-four gig RAM boxes with you know sixteen cores. You know, there's three of those that we're running on, and this is only yeah. taking up a small piece of that. Um, it so. A thousand, really, what, what is it? A thousand rows a a thousand second. Rows per second, I think. Yeah. And then it sounds like a lot, but it adds up very quickly. <laughs> yeah. We, but we have a lot of customers where, on average, they're bringing in a uh, hundred thousand rows a second. Yeah. So, yeah. 
and there's there's a lot of i think i just want to point out the efficiency part here of the in-memory aspects of the technology that allow it to run to be able to do that type of scale on commodity hardware no gpus required and not a ton of hardware behind it i mean the hardware can add up in our very large customers um but that that speaks directly to the design principles around being a very efficient um language and database sorry you yeah. know, i just wanted to yeah camera. i've always said kdb can do so much with so little <laughs> um it's uh, it's like it's, it's executable is still under a megabyte um at its core and again you know there's there's use cases there that would make that runs on a raspberry pi we have so many like little you know pet projects where people have run uh kdb on raspberry pi and it runs on arm systems as well um yeah, so yeah there's, look, a, there's a question on uh does the row represent a single measurement uh yes correct Sorry, I'm not seeing those chats. Um, thank, thank you for pointing that out, Steve. Yep. That's it. Um, yeah, look, I think that's, I kind of wanted to maybe pause there. Um, it's, it's we, we've only, you know, we're only at the tip of the iceberg, I guess, really at the, the power of KDB and Q. Um, you know, another USP of ours, uh, every client in their financial market space uses um, as of joins with KDB. And, you know, we've done so many kind of, I guess, comparisons with the Pandas uh, equivalent and just the performance difference is just astronomical. We, you know, we're always, you know, um, so much faster, I guess, um, yeah. than our, our competitors, I guess. You're you were going to pan over to the dashboard before I interrupted you again. Yeah, let, let me um, throw this up. It's going to take a minute to load. Again, yeah, we, we wanted to maybe show a quick visualization. There's, I've th again, through something here, a couple of drop downs, how you can, you know, change what's been presented here. And I've used, more so used the SQL integration here to, to show you that the kind of, interoperability as I guess as well so again here's an ANSI SQL statement and you know we've done parameters which are driven by what we call view states um, so these are all the options in the drop downs uh, just behind this window um, and so change you know I can change to this RAM and that'll load up um, I think I was doing this this little um, graphic is just showing the, the data rates so it's a uh, 60,000 rows per minute um and then again similar uh, statistic as as before just visualized doing the the average min max um uh, measurements by pod so again we've got four pods so that's just doing the group by and we're also let me double check this query how are we grouping this we're doing a so doing a group by pod um yeah, we're just getting the average min max and we're filtering on start and end time, which I think is the last five minutes or so. Um, I know that histograms were mentioned there, so I just wanted to show a, a basic example there. Um, there's, a, there's another question, Ian. Yeah. Um, in regards to pandas, comparison against pandas, meaning the embedded KDB versus a Jupyter notebook question. Um, let me see this comparison. About how many. Um, so I guess the what I was speaking to was um, pan, the pandas merge as of function versus our Q as of join and the performance difference. So um, yeah, it's 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 a reason why a lot of our clients choose us is is to be able to run that particular join and that um analysis um just you know hundreds of times quicker in some cases i hope that answers the question so perhaps also maybe what vj you're getting at there is um pykx pykx is how you can leverage kdb within a python environment 
Um, and so you can bring data frames or, you know, queue tables into that library and run uh, as of joins there too. It's just, a, again, it's another way, as Stephen said, it, it introduces people to the technology, but we always find that um, when they start there, they, they want to start keep digging and get to the core. Uh, so it's, it's, I guess it's a, a gateway to, to queue. Um, everyone ends up there, They're, they get so interested and they want to kind of harness the raw power and get, get to the core stuff, so yeah. Cool, thanks again. That's as about much for me. Is is there anything else um, Laura or Neil want to add or Steve yourself? Thank you for assisting there. I mean, we, we could probably have a discussion around some of the telemetry uh, and that use case. Chris, I don't know if there's, if we want to talk about that. We're, we've demonstrated in, in the, in the demo here, at least focused on the kind of high volume aspects, um, you know, at scale ingestion of telemetry is an area that we've played a lot in as well. Um, if we wanted to have, if we wanted any discussion around some of the more kind of technical aspects of Q, um, whether it's like array programming, data structures or anything like that, we can, we can have those as well. Yeah, I think, uh... I definitely want to ask about distributed histograms and how you might handle that in Q. Um, but another kind of question overall that might be interesting for um, the folks on the chat is Q really focused mostly at analytics of time series data and being able to massage it and extract information from it without having to export the data into a different system like pandas or something else to get that information? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. And I think we've always been described as bringing the analytics to the data, uh, you know, compared to the paradigm of, say, Snowflake, which is the separation of um, storage and compute, you know, so that pulls data out of the system and then, you know, spins out compute to run an analysis. But we try to bring our uh, yeah analysis to as close to the data as possible and um, so we're filtering you know directly on you know data that lives in memory or lives on disk as well and yeah so absolutely we, we bring our analytics to the data cool um so kind of tied with that then how often are you faced with customers asking for you to add some new analytics capability like for example um there are a lot of new um time series uh, kind of statistics to analyze um, and forecast and predict future behavior, um, all kinds of algorithms there that um, you'd have to implement or integration with different um, AI models nowadays. So how do you kind of balance those requests with keeping the language, you know, from growing too huge? Yeah, we, we've had a few different approaches over the years. Um, and there's probably one approach that I prefer in my own opinion, I'll tell you about that, but the two approaches are, A, we've built some sort of out of box uh, machine learning, uh, fresh libraries that are available on GitHub, they're open source, you can go pull those analytics and, uh, you know, some of them, some of the features we've kind of, where possible, rewritten in Q, if they're if that's possible, or leveraged Python on, on, under the hood um, or some C libraries, I'm not too sure of the detail. Um, the other approach is, is the play nicely with other technologies and, and you know, leverage technologies that do their job really well, right? And I see Python and machine, machine learning as, as that world, right? So how we do that and how this is my preferred approach is leverage Q and KDB for the, the data massaging and preparing that data for Python and, and a machine learning model. So filter the data, do your bucketing if you need to beforehand, uh, do your pivoting, all that kind of stuff, and then feed it into your machine learn, learning model. Because in reality, we have this other um, good demo I can and, uh, it on after it's uh it's it's just a, a trading you know market price uh, prediction right taking 
historical data, can you predict the trend, right? Is it going upwards, is it going downwards, whatever. Um, so we do the, the filtering the data, prepare the data, and then, you know, convert it into a data frame quickly, run it through a machine learning model. You know, at that point, we filtered down the data enough that um, Python can handle it, no problem, right? But we've, again, the data set is, you know, huge, right? Uh, and we've leveraged the power of KDB to, to prepare that data and then played nicely with Python and shipped it over and, you know, leveraged Python to do uh, what it does best with machine learning. So that's that's the approach I I prefer. Um, it's it's a you know play play nicely and and leverage a, a technologies for it, it's 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 you know USP it, it's power it's reason reason et cetera. Are there any other analytics capabilities that you'd like to call out that you don't see in other languages? Um, that customers enjoy? Yeah, I guess um, similar to win, sorry, similar to as of join, there's something called a window join. Um, that I think it's pretty unique. Again, I, I come from this with a, a non-computer science background, right? So I, I know less about other, you know, programming languages other than Python. Um, so window join is similar to as of join, but it allows you to sort of bucket windows uh windows of, of time so five minutes or two seconds or whatever um again that's another kind of powerful um join that is used quite often um I just it, it has all of the you know the the normal statistics um sort of uh, calculations and mathematics there uh, as back, you'd expect back testing is i mean that's another area that like quant researchers love using us for um, yeah. yeah. I don't know any other Laura if you have any any yeah. anything you want to add. Uh, do you have to announce the schema to use this uh, language or uh... Uh, can you just uh, ingest arbitrary time series and then ask questions with this language? Yes, schemas are important in KDB. Um, and, and we're, you know, we do, we're pretty, you know, we, we can be particular with types sometimes as well. So a classic example there was the, the that kind of var char element. So this, this symbol or string and if you want to do some filtering or grouping on a particular column metric in this, you know, example, then uh, if you if you're interested in performance, then we I would recommend doing a symbol type and defining your schema beforehand, um, and and you know casting all string incoming string data to a symbol type, then to perform those in analytics. So that's kind of an example of where schema is important and types are important in order to sort of squeeze every bit of, um, I guess, power out of the, the language. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Um, so does this mean that the language can be used for uh, logging type use cases as well, uh, instead of just metrics? It, it, tell me more about that. You mean like log analysis, BJ? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could you could parse logs. If that's what you're asking. Um, I've I've done that before. That was, that was like one of the first like use cases I was thinking about. VJ when I joined was, you know, massive AWS customer who's collecting logs from everything, whether it's VPC logs, CloudTrail, whatever. You know, how do you parse through that data? Um, I think there's probably like maybe a little bit of custom work to alert on what exactly you want, but it's, it's, I, I think it's, it's definitely in the, the same ballpark of capability. Yeah. yeah. If you think about it, it's, you know, I took, um, the string example that, um, was forwarded to me and it's just going to be very similar. Uh, you, you kind of, you that's going to have a timestamp. Um, you know, it'll probably have a log, uh, level, right? So maybe you want to pick out the warnings or the, the fatal errors. Um, the, and the, and 
you know, do regex on the body of the message to say, does it contain this? If it contains this, you know, flag an alert. So that would be like a very, I guess, easy example to do with KDB in a in a streaming sense, uh, if, you know, alerting was important. The, the other, I think, interesting part, oh, and we have another question from Sergey, but just that when we look at as of joins, I think one of the areas that Q stands out and KDB stands out is the ability to understand the millisecond before an event happened, what happened exactly before it and what happened exactly after that. So I, I don't want to wade too deeply into the observability space because I'm not deep in it. But when I think of like maybe a Splunk, sometimes you have to kind of know where to go look. I, I think this is accurate. I'm repeating what's been told to me. You may have to go look if an event happened or there was a potential, you know, security issue. You sometimes have to go and search for where or when it happened. And like the way we do as of joins, I think could be potentially interesting from an observ observability standpoint when you can see exactly what happened in the milliseconds leading up to that event. I don't know if that makes sense, but let's get let me get to Sergey's questions. Um. Ian, can you parse the logs to extract new fields that we could use in a query? The short answer is yes. I think that was related maybe to PJ's question. Henrik, is that helpful? Yeah, I was yeah, because you know logs is uh what logs is a wild, wild west. Uh, uh, even if we have a, a format like open telemetry that structure a bit the logs with a couple of attributes and so on. But uh, NGNX is doing their own logs. Uh, Apache is doing their own logs. Um, my, I don't know, I want to format my logs in a certain way. So logs has a lot of information and usually before you can do analytics or you can do anything about the logs, usually you try to parse the, the message content of the log. So you say, oh, this is a zip code or this is a, an address or this is, I don't know, the... The, the customer number and, and then you, you you extract it and you, then you take it to say I want to look at the number of product order uh number of product uh splitted by region whatever and those splitted dimensions come from the logs so that's why I, I was wondering if you can parse those information and then use it as as uh, data that you can Used to group by to do uh, to do uh, filtering to do whatever you want. Yeah, definitely. Um, I understand the the frustration of different apps, uh, you know, doing logs differently. So you'd end up having to, I guess, write different parsers for different applications, which is a little annoying. But that's that's life. That's that's software. <laughs> and and the uh, second question. Yeah, sorry. Second question that I didn't I didn't drop it is is uh, about uh, spans. So uh, Open Telemetry introduced the notion of distribute tracing, and uh, in in Open Telemetry world you can uh, you can produce uh, uh, traces and traces at the end is a yes a JSON object to be honest. Uh, so being able to also take that JSON object uh, that is well structured, but you can have uh, other type of information depending on who is building the trace uh, and if we could basically also do some queries on that type of uh, data structure. Yeah, I mean, we have native sort of parsers for, for JSON. Um, so I can see that certainly helping in, in that case. Okay. So, so you're saying there, there will be almost a JSON message at the end Long no, message. so so the the distrib the spans is a, is a, is a step within a transaction. So a, a transaction going from I don't know different services is called a trace, and a, a trace is made of spans, and each individual steps within the transaction become uh, one element of the trace. So it's like a a trace is a JSON array, I would say, to be very simple to simplify the process, and then each individual step. Of the actual trace is is uh, one object, one element of the array, and then you have different information about the duration, uh, who has called who, uh, when when did that function start, when did that function end, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. 
Yeah, we, we have a type in uh, KDB. It's kind of, it's a very open, flexible type. Um, well, like, okay, so so I can see how you can, you could store dictionaries raw, and then you can quite easily index into those dictionaries if you want to pick out a certain field. And um, that's something that's really powerful as well. So again, it's, it's .j .k would so parse a dictionary. End, so at the end, could you, we could uh, extend this dictionary to define the, uh, the actual open telemetry schema because open telemetry has a definition for metrics, traces, and logs, uh, and probably soon for, for, um, for profiling. Um, so which means if you have a standard ad schema, then if we introduce that in your solution, then you're already able to sort of in understand what, yeah. what, uh, what we're dealing with. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Great, thanks. And tied in with tracing is kind of the graph problem set. Um, do you have any graph processing capabilities? Graph, not so much. Um, I see graph, I get, I'm getting asked about graph databases yeah. a lot lately. Um, we are not a graph database, if I understand. <laughs> I know a little about it, I, I'll be very honest. Um, I need to do some research there. And then Sergey, you had a question. Yeah, I'm still a little bit confused with uh, uh, data model which language runs on top. So uh, Ian, I think in the very beginning you mentioned that it's time series, right? So it's, uh, it's a measurement associated with the timestamp and some, some context uh, of the measurement. Uh, and initially you said just the value and what's the value is, <clears throat> I'm still a bit confused, sorry if I'm slow. The value is just a numeric value. I don't know, like a yeah. Or can it be something else as well? Can it be a histogram? Can it be some summary or any other data type? Like what's the value? Yeah, I guess in this example, it was I was using measurement a lot um, and it's just a numeric value. And so mm -hmm. we would have all the different, sorry, all the different types of um, numeric values available, float, integer. We have concept of real longs and stuff. Um, let me just pull up. I mean, we have... Uh, comparison here in relation to different um, programming languages and, and sort of our equivalent, right? So this is a link on our webs, on our code website, developer website. Um, so basic data types, um, here are all the different options, an example in queue sort of in this area. And then you've kind of the equivalent in a SQL, uh, java.net. So these are the types that we sort of natively support. You can see a lot of time elements there and then a lot of uh, numerical elements there, some varchar elements and some goods and booleans and stuff. And then uh, you kind of just have this open, the, the one I was talking about, the, the sort of open uh, data type, you can kind of just put anything there. Um, any map is an option there too, we call it. So you can kind of just throw anything in there if it's just very unstructured. Um, okay, okay. So for example, I mean, I'm trying to uh, understand as a auto user, I'm trying to ingest the data and this data is exponential histograms. So I push it into this any data type, right? Then how would I, for example, at the query time, extract some arbitrary percentile from that histogram? Is it, is it possible? So, what do you mean when you say a histogram data type? So, I mean, OTEL, if, if you're familiar, right, they allow you to publish histograms from the client side. You can configure your measurement infrastructure, right? So it publishes the histogram, exponential histogram. It's a bucket that compressed histogram. And then they kind of just send it to you in their format, which they publish. Uh, it's open format. And then on the back end, if you receive it, you basically can do work with this histogram, extract percentile, I don't know, count buckets, thing like that. Okay. I mean, I don't know if it could be formatted into a dictionary type or a table type or a list of lists, then, you know, if that's the case, we can support that and it can be... Okay, okay. So it's kind you of know, a translation upon ingestion, right? You need to translate it into some suitable yeah. format. I see, and then it can work with. 
Got it. To to an extent, yeah, I suppose it's um there's probably a performance consideration there as well. Um yeah, you you know, you might help yourself by doing translation on ingest, but also there's there's nothing stopping you sort of doing the translation on query too. So that's that's also possible. Um so I guess it would it might even it just would maybe come down to a, a performance thing, what would be more efficient. Uh, and it's also a data storage problem too, right? What what makes more sense? What format uh does it make more sense to store in and, and space, right? Um, that's a consideration too. Is that is that a very specific observability question? It's just, again, like histograms are very, uh, I'm just looking at our customers, right? Histograms are very useful when it comes to latencies. Latencies, percentiles of the latencies, things like that. And best you can do probably with histograms because you would want to aggregate them uh, temporarily, right? So let's say, get my P99 over a day. Uh, what was it, right? Histograms here to help and um, all tells suggest this exponential, which is pretty pretty good at both the performance and the functional capabilities. I was just wondering if you guys have, a, have an answer for that. I'll follow up on it. I mean, I, I, I don't. Okay, okay, thank you. Definitely send on maybe some, some content on that. I, I'd, I'd be curious to look into that too. I think that this it's a, it kind of goes to the gap I spoke about earlier where we haven't played in the observability space formally, but I feel like a lot of what we do is transferable there. I, I don't know, Chris or VJ, if you have any feedback right yeah. now, if, if that's an accurate assumption. Yeah, I think uh, histograms in general are a statistical concept. Uh, I think uh, it, um, what was being described was within the context of observability and uh, open telemetry, but uh, I think uh, given a sample space, uh, you should be able to extract what the 99th percentile of measurements were and things like that. So it, it doesn't necessarily even have to be a time series. Uh, just a, given a bunch of numbers, you should be able to compute uh, percentiles and things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, 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 my question is uh, around similar uh, uh, concepts. Uh, your language, does it support statistical models uh, through built-in functions? Uh, um, uh, is the language used in, uh, um, in uh, say, anomaly detection and other things uh, pertaining to machine learning and things like that? Yes, yes. Yeah, Supported. You you would often you know build that I, I guess yourself, um, and you should have everything available to you, sort of mathematically and statistically within within the programming language to, to build that. Um, and again, there's there's going to be a ton of repos on on GitHub which will kind of accelerate that process too. Uh, and are there any inbuilt functions that do any statistical analysis, may I ask? Uh, for example, uh, Prometheus has uh, the whole printers function. Um, uh, I know there are there are several of those out there. Uh, uh, does uh, does uh, Q support any of the such languages out of the box? So, I'll send maybe a screenshot and a link. Can I send screenshots in here? Maybe not. Um, category. So again, we can load. We can. We will have a couple of our own um, statistics fun functions. Um, we can use Python under the hood as well for others, and we can also integrate with C and and sort of. Use leverage those natively on on KDB data. So there's you Thank know you. standard definition, deltas, moving averages, all that sort sort of stuff there. Mm -hmm. And even quantiles, I believe. Ian, I just messaged you a link. I don't know if that's worth sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, it is worth sharing, definitely. 
Yeah, I think that's similar to what I just sent through. It's just another, yeah. Okay. If I drop that in the chat there, Steve. I did, yeah. Got it there, good the, uh, one, of, one of the things I meant to point out earlier, the if we're talking about statistics, the the heritage of KX and KDB is is firmly in mathematics and financial mathematics, quantitative mathematics. So there's, um, you know, anytime there's uh, potential to collaborate, um, we have a lot of interesting pockets of mathematicians still at KX um, that we we could go search for. You know, our, our marketing, our chief marketing person up until a couple of weeks ago was a um, financial mathematician so uh, yeah. they're all, they're I'm all definitely right. not that <laughs> so I struggle sometimes there cool. um, right. and then DJ the, just as a final note on kind of building um, some you know AI machine learning algorithms with KDB and Q that's probably a, a whole other conversation because there's there's a lot to unpack there as well there's a, um, I'll share it as follow up. There is a white paper that just came out of the Imperial College of London about doing um, value at risk calculations in real time. Uh, it's on derivative portfolios, but I think there's a lot of um, applicability of that model uh, where it creates a machine learning model and then updates it in real time as that streaming data comes in. I think there's a lot of different use cases um, for what was published, so we can pass that along as well. Right. Um, yeah, so we've gone over a bit, um, and I want to thank everybody who's joined. What? Sh uh, how should folks have for further questions reach out to you? Um, you can share my information uh, in Ian's email. Um, any, if there's a if there's enough interest in doing a follow-up session on specific questions, we're more than happy to chase those down and share them or set up another time to join and bring in different resources that might be able to dive deep in a specific area. As I said earlier, we really are interested in working with CNCF and um, in supporting the working group. We think we have a lot to offer from a query language standardization standpoint. Thanks. If you want to get your your hands dirty on the the technology, you can. There's free trials. Uh, you can get Jupyter notebooks or Jupyter Lab uh, environments set up very easily. Um, you know, I think search KX Academy and KX Community, and you'll you'll find some very helpful resources. Thanks for the plug there, Ian. I was actually just going to mention the community um, community.kx.com. I'll send the links into the chat here. Um, and the academy as well, if you want to get your hands on kind of the language itself. And there's some there's free sandboxes there as well that you so you don't need to do any setup, they're just there automatically for you to play around with. Yeah. Great. Right. Super. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Stephen Ian, Neil, Laura, um, and everybody else who's been able to attend. Um it's been a great presentation, and uh, yeah, we'll follow up in the channels and get your PR up there. Um, and that was great. All right, well, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Bye. Take care.